So what motivated me to look into this, and I'll go through a couple of things. One, I am wearing my in blue line shirt. So my son is a deputy sheriff with the Frederick mm -hmm. County Sheriff's Office. And I really wanted to capture some of the traffic that goes on when, when he's out working, most importantly, just to, to hear the things that are going on. Not wanting to listen to it real time, because that could be very stressful, but just have a record of what's going on. So one service I started to use was Broadcastify. So there's multiple um, apps for your mobile phones that can connect to this service. And you can click on Listen, select your state, your, your region, basically, and then it shows you some channels that are available if you scroll down. So you'll notice for the Frederick County Sheriff's Office, it's mixed with fire, EMS, and state police. So listening to this channel, it can be very chatty, and a lot of the mixed traffic will step on one another. So you may be listening to police procedures or calls going on, and then you get a fire call on top of that or an EMS call on top of that or state police traffic on top of that. So you don't always hear what you necessarily wanted to hear. So... I wanted a way to just focus on what is going on just on the, the police dispatch channels. So this was a project to let me do that. So I wanted to use, uh, I'll, I'll get into all the, 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 the rigmarole. So let's go back and let's go through a small set of slides. So one of the challenges I ran into is that there's a lot of information out there on how to do this. It's just not all in one place. And it's not that complicated once you get through the terminology and the, 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 the softer projects that are out there and understand what all the options are. But, but it can be a little bit of a steep learning curve just to, to round that corner. So hopefully what I present today will make it easier if others want to experiment with this as well. So let's get into what is oh, – any questions before we get going? Any, anybody with like background in this or any, any comments before we dive too far? Okay, so what is digital trunked radio? So let's get into some of the theory behind this and, and, and why. So this really came out of a need to overcome scale and interoperability challenges. So when you think of portable radios, there are pairs of frequencies. There's an input frequency to some repeater and an output frequency from the repeater. The repeaters, which there can be multiple of them, are then sort of wired into some dispatch public safety operations center. So this all works as a seamless system. And conventional use was just having people talk on these frequencies. So everybody had the same frequencies. You'd wait your turn to talk. Everyone can hear everyone. It was a fixed set of frequencies. And for a limited number of users, it worked pretty well. So that's how things were with public safety for quite a long time, or even other types, types of use cases. And the way you would scale this is you might split by geography. So you could have like the north dispatch frequencies, the south dispatch frequencies. You could continually add new frequencies to get bigger scale or add more repeaters as people, you know, covered more area. But eventually this just falls apart as you get a certain number of users on the system. You just cannot scale conventional use of public safety radio. Now, that's not to say, you know, there's areas of the country where this is still the way things are done. Not everyone is using Project 25, but um, this is the driving force behind it. I used to work with a guy named Dan Veneman, and he used to, he wrote articles for something called Signal Harbor. So this was an explanation of trunked radio that I grabbed from 2005. So he had written a lot of really good articles on this, and, if you, and I'd recommend that link below if you want to learn more about it or, or get some better understanding. So trunking is not a new concept at all. It's been around forever. Um, and this is sort of the sorry all circuits are busy. So I had somebody in the 90s talk to me about POTS and PANS. So POTS is the plain old telephone system, the, the old dial-up that we used to have. And PANS is the pretty advanced neat stuff. So it's easier to understand trunking when you think about how the old phone system used to work. So from a central switching office or some, some hub, there are dedicated digital um, twisted pairs to each user. But when you're calling somebody across town or across country, there's not a possible circuit for everyone to talk to everyone all the time. So you have a massive number of wires to everybody connected to a central switching office, but there's fewer connections available between the switching offices or even long distance. So they have to share these links. So what happens is if someone on the left wants to call grandma on the right, 
They will dial the number. Their twisted pair will connect to a central switching office. It will then use one of a limited number of lines to sort of create a virtual circuit to talk to the person on the other end. And when they're done, those connections are freed so they can be used by somebody else. What was interesting is in the late 80s, I guess early 90s, when modems became popular, this really taxed the phone system. They were not structured for people to be on the phone hours on end, multiple number of people doing this. Like they had to scale up quite a bit to be able to handle that. And I think, you know, others may know more here, but like ISPs had to, you know, work out situations where they had phone banks in multiple regions and multiple numbers to try to try to alleviate some of that that stress on the on the phone system. But that's the idea of trunking. So you're just basically creating virtual circuits then dropping them when you no longer need it. So from a radio perspective, there are multiple repeaters and they're going through some central system controller. So they're getting dynamically assigned frequencies to use out of some set that they have to deal with the, the large number of people that are on the system at any one time. So it's not that there's a specific frequency you're always using. There's a control frequency but then the traffic channels are dynamic based on, on use and, and, and who's talking and what the reasons are. So to do this, people are assigned to talk groups. So a talk group is just a logical grouping of users. So it has no meaning other than it can, it's something that a frequency can be temporarily assigned to and then taken away. And it's the system controller that has the pool of frequency pairs. So radios are programmed to have certain talk groups included, and then they can use um, the control channel, and I'll show you the, the actual uh, um, steps that are involved, to assign frequencies to those talk groups dynamically. So, so it's not a, a fixed mapping. So this is the trunking process that occurs. Um, so you have the control channels that are carrying instructions and status for you know, for a digital trunk radio, in this case, this is a very applicable to Project 25. And then you have traffic channels that are carrying some status information, but mostly encoded voice. So when you hit the push to talk radio button, the following steps are going to happen. So first, and steps one through seven, this all takes less than a second. So all the radios are in what's called an idle state if no one's talking. And what that means is that they're all tuned to the control repeater output frequency. So they're listening to the control channel coming out of the various repeaters scattered in a geographical area. So you'll put you'll, you'll hit the push to talk button. When you do that, your radio is going to send a request on the control channel to the, the, the controller saying, this is my talk group identifier, I need a frequency. So the controller will look at all the available traffic channels that it has, the frequency pairs, and it will mark a channel in use and assign it to your talk group. It will then broadcast that on the control channel. Everyone in this talk group switch to this frequency. So all the radios that are in that talk group will tune that frequency to listen to the traffic, and then the portable radio will emit some sort of go-ahead tone to the user, or if there's nothing available, my son says he gets a bonk. So he has a Motorola um, system with the sheriff's office. So he'll either get a quick beep, like it's okay to talk, or he'll get some kind of louder sound that says try again in a few seconds. So that's that's what happens. So, so you're going to have an idle state where you're just listening to the control channel. When you hit the push to talk button, it's going to dynamically assign you a channel. At that point, you talk. So you give whatever message you want, and it's going to get repeated out to everybody on that um, who's, who's tuned to that frequency. When you're done talking and you release that button, your radio will send a finished message to the controller. The controller will then broadcast to everybody on that traffic channel that this talk group is no longer active. Those radios will then go back to their idle state. They'll tune the control channel, and then the controller will release the traffic channel and mark it as not in use so it can be used by somebody else. So it's quite the process that's going on there, but they're dynamically assigning frequency pairs. The system dynamically assigns frequency pairs every time you know you hit that button and want to talk to somebody. Any questions? All right. So what's Project 25, and, and how does this factor in? So the Association of Public Safety Communication Officials, they created a set of standards in the late 80s. 
And all of these standards are collectively known as Project 25. I'm going to talk about Phase 1 systems because that's what the county currently uses, although they did purchase a bunch of new radios and they are moving to Phase 2 systems. I think my son said they're, they're, they're targeting July, but it depends how quickly the county can roll out the radios. And it's not just the sheriff's office. It's everybody. So I'll show you some of the reference pages where you can look. But, I mean, we're talking maintenance, water and sewer, uh, the bus transportation system, just all the county operations, fire, of course, you know, b besides besides the police. Um, so for a phase one system, there are 12 and a half kilohertz traffic channels and it's designed for you know single person talking on each channel there's two ways to encode this there's a continuous four level fm or c4 fm or compatible quadrature phase shift keying so we can look at the plot they are using quadrature phase shift keying for frederick county and i'll show you where you can find that but what that means is that each symbol is phase shifted 90 degrees from the other symbols, and then they use a gray, gray code uh, method to make sure that adjacent channels only differ by one bit, and that helps with error correction. So you have 4,800 symbols per second, but each symbol represents two bits. So on that 12.5 kilohertz frequency, uh, the, the, the frequency range, you're, you're sending 9,600 bits a second. Um, so 4,400 of that is used what's called multi-band excitation codec so they're they're encoding the voice traffic uh 2800 bits are reserved for forward error correction to deal with any sort of um, glitches in the in the transmission or reception and then 2400 bits per second are for signaling and control so the it uses all of the capacity of that channel i think with phase two the channel might be a little wider or there might be a better data rate i'm not 100 percent sure on that and if anybody knows, please please speak up, speak up. But that's how it's all broken down. So there's 4,800 symbols per second, but it's a 9,600 bit per second rate. So a lot of the information for public radio is is publicly available. Um, you can look at the list of FC, F, FCC licenses that the county has. I plotted the location of all of the repeaters in Frederick County. So you'll notice like up near Emmitsburg, there's one just on 140 to the right. Um, there's one near Cunningham Falls State Park. There's one down near, uh, oh, what's that called? A lot of bikers go there, like a mountain bikers. Um, I'm drawing a blank. So there's a few in the city. There's one near me, near me in Newmarket, and then there's one further south, you know, to the west of Adamstown. Now, my son has told me that up near Sibyllisville, there's a, there is a lot of dead spots. I don't know if you guys can see my uh, mouse moving, but... I'm circling around the word Sibyllisville. So uh, there's, it's very mountainous up, up there. And he said there's nothing scary than, you know, dealing with uh, calls for service or, 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 you know, traffic stops and you don't have reliable radio communication. So he said it gets a little scary when they work what's called north. So this is considered North County. Um, and, and there's just quite a few drops up there. Is, that, is there a question or somebody joining or? Okay. I, just, I was going to tell you, we do see your mouse, so it does help. Okay, great, great, great. So, uh, so you can look, so I'll send you these slides after we're done, but you can list, look at the list of FCC licenses. Radioreference.com is a great website. It actually gives you all of the publicly available information that's been accumulated, including all the frequencies, the talk groups, all sorts of stuff. And we'll drill into that after, after I get through the slides. And then all of, there's a link to all of the Frederick County data as well. So the control frequency for the county is 854.9875 megahertz. There's a network access code, it's hexadecimal 441, and there's over 100 talk groups on that channel. I will warn you, though, lots of channels are encrypted. So in the United States, it is not only illegal to decode or decrypt. Actually, it's, it, it is, it's illegal to decrypt um, radio traffic that's encrypted, but it's even illegal to try. So, so it's not even, it's just not something you, you, you want to mess around with. But let's do a little look at um, encryption. So on the left, I have the Summit supercomputer at one of the national laboratories. In 2018, this was the fastest computer on the planet. I don't know if that's still the case, but at one time it was, and happens to be running Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, 
not all of the Project 25 encryption methodologies are, are strong. Like some systems may be using RSC40, which is pretty weak. And this is where, you know, it is a felony to, to try to, to decrypt the data, not even successfully do it, just to even try. But a lot of users are using AES-256, and that's really what they should be using. That, that's their strongest option. And, the, and where that is the case, it doesn't really matter that it's illegal to do this. It's just not feasible. So that supercomputer pictured on the left can do 200,000 trillion floating point operations a second. That's what its speed was in 2018. If you look at searching half of the key space for AES-256, and we make a big assumption that it takes one floating point operation to try a key, which I don't think is very realistic, and you're looking at four followed by like 47 or 51 zero years to try to, to try half of the key space. So, so that's longer than the universe has ever existed. It's longer than the universe will probably exist. Like it's just such an enormous amount of time with the world's most powerful computer that it's not realistic you'll ever um, um, break that uh, encryption. And, and the other thing, too, about encryption is it's never really the strength of the algorithms or the keys. It's always how it's implemented. Somebody leaks some information. Somebody gives information away inadvertently. So. All right, so what is a software-defined radio? Well, it's not hard to understand. A software-defined radio is simply a radio where some of the functions have been taken over by software. So when you think of a radio, you have to demodulate, modulate, mix, filter. There's a lot of things that are going on that was typically handled by hardware. So with software-defined radios, you're giving all of that function to, or a lot of those functions to software. So this allows you to do almost anything you want with the, with the radio. You can change how it processes frequencies, the protocols it uses, the filters you want to use. There's just a lot of power here when you're dealing with a software-defined radio. Now, this is the hardware that I bought, and this kit is available for less than $40. So rtl-sdr.com is the website I went to. And what you get is actually a TV tuner. So, so the thing on the left was originally intended for um, um, TV reception, but it was programmable. It has uh, thermally compensated um, um, electronics so that it doesn't get affected by temperature when, and it stays locked on a frequency pretty well. And this is all available for under $40. So they give you a cut. They come with a, uh, a little antenna kit. So you get two dipole and whip antennas, you know, the short and long, and they're, and they're telescopic. They can get pretty big. You get a uh, adhesive mount here on the right. So you can, Mount your it's you know stick your antenna to the wall if you want. There's an extender for the coax. There's a uh, mount for the antenna as well. So this this mount here can plug into here or into this tripod. So the tripod has um, flexible legs that you can wrap around things as well. So it's actually a very nice um, um, kit that they send you. The only caveat I'll say is that you know this shipped from China and it took over six weeks to get this. This thing took a long time to reach me. So it. You know, I don't know if that's related to COVID or if that's just normal, but the shipping times were pretty long to, to get the... that. That is normal for China. But with that in mind, would any TV tuner be... Could you go to Amazon and get a T, just a standard TV tuner from there? So we'll get into that a little bit. I'm not sure. Like with the software, there were specific drivers for this thing that, that were also installed. So as long as you have the drivers or you can communicate with it, it's a USB interface on one end. So it's going to show up as a serial device. And then on the other end is the coax for the antenna. So I, I don't know if any TV tuner would, would, would meet this. This is specifically engineered to work as a software-defined radio. So, you know, it's that capability, those chips, plus some other electronics in here. So I'm not sure, you know, if, if that would pan out or not. So for software, does that answer your question before I move forward here yeah it does so for software there are several things you're going to want to install and the first thing is uh, gqrx so this is the gnu radio software with a nice qt graphical toolkit interface um, the reason you want to do this one when you have uh, someone tell you that this is the control frequency you can actually punch it in and then make sure with the waterfall graph that that's what you're seeing. So this shows you signal strength over time. So 
I can see the Fourier transform where that's the spike I want. That's the frequency right there. But then over time, I see this bright yellow line saying, yes, that is the frequency. That's the strongest signal out of several signals. Some of these ones to the right are actually Montgomery County. Some of their control channels are showing up. Um, the other reason you want to install this package is it pulls in quite a few dependencies and drivers and things you're going to need to run the OP25 project. So OP25 is a fork of something called GROSCOM. I'm not sure exactly what the original project was for, but this gives you the ability to decode Project 25 radio signals. So this is all written in Python. Um, it has some really cool interfaces, and we'll see it live in a second. Um, and it can sh it can stream to Shoutcast servers. So once you have the the uh, the the system properly configured and decoding what you want, you can then share that with like uh, IceCast server and have internet to find radio and you can even send this up to broadcastify if you want i have an account i just haven't set that all up yet and i'm not sure what the requirements are hey rich yes just just to disappoint you i found it on amazon it can be delivered today to annandale 38 oh, nice, nice. <laughs> so i bought it directly from rtl sdr but yeah maybe amazon has a bunch of them So the other thing I'm running is an IceCast server. So this allows you to define a mount point. So it's just a, it's just a web location, and then you can listen to the streams. So you'll see that there's a listen URL right here. That's where you can just directly connect to my server on port 8000 and listen to whatever the latest uh, conversation is. Because of the decoding and, and all the things that are going on, there's about a, I'd say, 20-second delay between live and, and what you're able to hear through this. So, so there is some delay that occurs. Um, and then you can click on the links over here and just play these with different tools or play them directly in a browser. All right, so let's talk about my setup really quickly. So I have the RTL SDR receiver plugged into a Raspberry Pi 4. I'm running the OP25 receiver code, uh, the you know, program to, to decode what's coming off of this, this hardware. And then it's forwarding that traffic to a liquid soap ice cast client. So Liquid Soap is a package that implements an IceCast client and lets you be a source client. So an IceCast server can have both um, listen clients and source clients. So I'm a source client streaming information. In my basement, I have a Fedora 34 server and it's running an Ice IceCast server. The reason I did that is I didn't want to put all of the load on the Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi is busy enough decoding these signals and, and streaming data. It doesn't need a bunch of clients connecting to it to listen as well. So I, I installed the IceCast server somewhere else. And then I also set up some systemd processes and things to capture a lot of the information. And then you can use a laptop or you can use your phone. You can listen to this with like clients like VLC. You can connect to the IceCast server just with a browser and listen to the radio. Um, can... Um, can the IceCast server run on a second Raspberry Pi, or sure. is it? Sure. Okay, so you could have two Raspberry Pis. Yeah. Because I've got like six Raspberry Pis sitting here doing nothing, so. Yeah, you can easily run this on the second Pi if you want. There, there's there's packages to do that. And and the, the, the actual thing, the, you know, the Raspberry Pi is kind of an artifice here, so I did it just to have a very cheap little scanner, but... You could just plug that RTL SDR. I, I've plugged it into my Mac and ran the software. I've plugged it into like other Linux boxes and ran the software. So there's nothing really special about the packages. I mean, they're just they're available on the Raspberry Pi, but that same software could be compiled and run on other um, systems as well. So Raspberry Pi, as I explained, it's running the OP25 receiver. So the OP25 is a project on GitHub. You download the source, you build it, it's ready to go. On the Raspberry Pi 4, that build could take over an hour. On the on the or on, on the Raspberry Pi 3, that build could take over an hour. With the Pi 4, it takes about 10 minutes. So there's a big difference in power between the two. And I have an 8 gig R Pi 4. I got the Canna kit, so it's everything's included. Um, so you're running Liquid Soap and you're running Op uh, Op 25. I set up System D to run those both as rootless services. 
So they're actually set up to restart on failure and, and they have dependencies between them. I'll show you all that stuff. Um, and then what's nice about the Op25 project is some folks added a uh, web interface to it. So rather than having to log into the RPI or use a VNC to see a desktop if you're running headless, you can just go to a web server and I'll show you what that looks like and just look at what's going on with the decoding. And then the liquid soap is just there to act as a source client to forward everything to the IceCast server. So this is what the Op25 web interface looks like. We'll, we'll see this in real time. So there's several things across the top. There's a home that shows you, you know, what you're tuned to, what's going on, what the frequency error is, what is the fine-tune offset, which because of the experimental auto-tuner will keep tracking that and keeping it um, um, tuned. You can blacklist or whitelist talk groups if you don't want to hear certain people talking. You can look at the log to see what's going on. Um, you can go to a, a specific uh, group, but you know there's there's I only have the one. So this shows you under system frequencies, it shows you the various traffic channels, how many seconds since they were last used, and which talk group is assigned to them. So when you see this thing running, you'll see talk groups just getting dynamically assigned to traffic channels, and the list of traffic channels will expand or contract based on how much time they've been idle. Um, on my Fedora 34 server, I'm running my IceCast server, and I have systemd timers and services to not only run the IceCast server, but I'm using curl to just get get the um, streams and archive them. And then I'm also using systemd and some of their timer facilities and, and uh, temporary file cleanup to remove any streams older than 14 days. So I'm, I'm managing data on that server. It's looking at files that haven't been accessed in 14 days and, and deleting them. And then it's also um, listening on the IceCast server and archiving a lot of the traffic. So when my son, after a shift, tells me I had an interesting call at like 10 o'clock at night, I can go back and grab that audio stream and listen to it. Then I think I showed you this earlier, but this is the IceCast web interface, shows you the various URLs for listening and how that all works. And then finally, like I said, you can once you have this all set up, you can use any any number of clients to listen to it. So so phones can play it through the browser, you can play it through the browser on your laptop, you can run VLC. There's a lot of things you can use to to listen to the the stream. All right, so let's show this stuff actually working. So the first thing we're going to look at is the OP25 interface itself. So you'll see that there are some talk groups being used, 5541. Um, and then it'll go away. So it's it's they're talking right now. That's why it's like 0.3 seconds from last use. And then eventually it'll go away. And now this frequency is available for somebody else to use. You'll see so they're responding on a different frequency. And there's another talk group going on. Some of these can be county maintenance sites. If we go to plot, we can look at various characteristics of the signal that we're receiving. So if I go to the fast Fourier transform, hopefully this is working. There it is. So there's the control frequency. It's it's the strongest channel. And you'll see everything to the left or right of that is, is, is more in the noise. I can look at the constellation. So this shows me if I'm decoding the quadrature phase shift keying, I should see four tightly defined groups, you know, and, and it's showing me where the samples are showing. So they're pretty well grouped. The the um, because of the forward error correction and some of the things in there, the voice the voice is pretty clear, even if the signal isn't being as neatly received as you'd like it to be. And I've also found that the longer I run this, the better that gets. So it is auto tuning, so it's getting better and better at tracking the frequency over time. You can look at the symbols that are being decoded as sort of a time series. So it's showing me the four symbol streams over time and you know, what the what the um, values are for them. And then I can look at the uh, the data scope. So I'm not I'm not deep in the radio um, technology here, Mark, but this was telling me it's supposed to look like an eyeball. And and that's a that's a good good indication. So you'll see that it comes and goes, but it's pretty well well defined. So the mixer, you want to see a nice hump here where the, the control channels in the free in the center. Um, mixer balance five. When I started playing with this, before I found out there was an auto tuner, this thing was over 20 or 30. The signal reception was terrible. So once you enable the auto tuner, this really does drive this value down and give you a nice sort of shape to where you're listening and, and not too far off from where you want to be. 
And then the tuner shows you um, a little bar chart. You want that thing to be as close to zero as possible. So when I started, it was like way up here. It was way down here. These, these buttons right here let you fine tune. So you can go up in steps of 1200 or you can go up in steps of 100 hertz. So you can sort of try to do this yourself but you're never going to beat the auto-tuning capability. So it's it's really doing good. It's got a fine-tune offset of 6, and, and the frequency error is minus 70 hertz right now. So it's actually pretty dialed in. So let's take a look at some of the... Um, let me close this. Let's take a look at some of the radio reference information that's out there. So if I click on Sorry, this... I, I didn't unmute in time. How do you set up auto-tuning? It's or just an option. I'll show you. It's an option when you when you set up the services to run. Okay. There's a specific, there's a specific uh, option for the command. You just for you give it. So I'll I'll go through all that. Let's okay. drill into radio reference. So if we go to radio reference, we can go to databases, and you pick your. And this is very this website and Broadcastify. I think they're they're run by the same organization or they're they're related. Click on Frederick. Click on Frederick County. So this shows you some information about the county, and if you drill in, here is all of the information that you're going to need. If you have an account, you can download some of this stuff, which makes it easier to configure things. If not, you can do it the hard way. So this tells me it's a Project 21, 25 Phase 1 system. It's running the Common Air Interface. This was last updated. This information was last updated on May 22nd. It gives you the system ID you're going to need in HEX. Um, control frequencies are in red, so right here is where I got that 854.9875 megahertz. Um, if I scroll down, here's all the talk groups for the county. So the fire has about 40, um, the sheriff has about 10. Anything with an E after it, so D means digital, E means encrypted. So my son explained countywide is for announcements that might go out not necessarily dispatch. Dispatch 1 is the primary dispatch channel. Dispatch 2 and 3 exist. If something serious is going on, they'll move normal operations to the other channels so that the folks can just have the channel to deal with whatever the, 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 the situation is. And then when it's done, they'll release the channel back. Um, these two encrypted channels, one is for the narcotics, one is for criminal investigations. You have a uh, channel for the courthouse, School resource officers have a dedicated channel. Any special events, there's a channel like the fair. They'll have they'll have on channel um, 5409. And then finally, the SWAT has an encrypted channel for, for tactical operations. Um, my son said once the uh, new radios are fully rolled out to the county, most of this is going encrypted. So I think they're going to leave Dispatch 1 unencrypted, but I'm not sure. And if you scroll down further, there's a bunch of county things like county highways, maintenance, landfill, all that stuff is available. But uh, if you notice, like Frederick City Police, they're, they're completely encrypted. Primary dispatch is encrypted. Everything's encrypted. The only thing they have is some dispatch one channel, but I don't think anyone uses it. So without the, without the keys, you cannot listen to the city at all. It's, it's all just noise. Um, there's some city services that are on there. There's schools, and then you have the state police. You'll notice that you know none of these the state police channels aren't encrypted. A lot of the stuff is not encrypted. So um, the county may encrypt more of the sheriff uh, channels once they have the new radios rolled out. And I'm not sure if it's going to be available. So this is a debate in in public radio. You know these frequencies are public channels. Uh, the FCC gives them out to both individuals and governments, like corporations and others. So news organizations would like access to this information. They think it's part of the First Amendment, that they should know what the government's up to. Um, a good balance has been to leave one dispatch channel unencrypted, but encrypt the rest. That way that, you know, if there's some major event, news organizations can be alerted to it. In some jurisdictions where everything is encrypted, they've provided radios to news organizations, or they've told the news organization, go buy your own radio, because these things are thousands of dollars. And we will program it for you so you can listen to what's going on. So so there's varying ways people deal with the encryption and, and having access to public information. And I don't think there's a good answer. I mean, you want to keep people safe. I will bring up one specific uh, situation that ha happened. So either last year or the year before, I'm not exactly sure the time frame, 
murder suspects that were being chased in southern Pennsylvania crossed into Frederick County. And there was a shootout near Emmitsburg. Like, I think these guys made a stand at a gas station or something. Two young people who were listening to all of this on the scanner went out to see what was going on and nearly got shot by the police. So there was an article in the Frederick News Post about this, that, you know, it's incredibly dangerous to listen to these things live and rush to the scene to, to sort of, you know, rubberneck what's going on, that you really, you really do not want to do that. Um, it, it causes just a lot of confusion. You know, there's my sons repeatedly told me that, you know, anytime things go like sideways like that, all bets are off. It's unpredictable. What's what can happen? And you just want to just avoid those kind of situations where you have no no idea of how that's going to turn out. Um, but but there were there, there was a recent Frederick News Post article about two young people basically going to see what's happening and nearly getting shot themselves because there was confusion on whether they were the suspects or not. So. Not a great idea. Um, but there's a ton of information here. Here's where you get all the talk groups you're going to need, information like that. So let's go ahead and look at how to set this all up. So I'm actually going to run my VNC viewer. Hold on one second. Let me go to server. And we'll log into the Pi. Give it the password. Whoops. So this is the um, X window interface for the Pi. The reason I bring that up, I want to show you some of the configuration files. So if I go into Office Calc, there are two files you need to set up to work with the Op25 software. One is your trunking file, and that defines the talk groups uh, or where the talk groups are stored, and then any whitelist you want to use. So if I go to Recent Documents, Trunk, TSV. So it's a tab separated value list. So you read this where tabs delineate what's in here. So the first column is a system name. It's whatever you want. I don't know if you guys can see this. It looks like it might be too small. Let me see if I can uh, make this a little bigger for you. Let's go to 100. What is it 100? How about. Go to like 150. There you go. So the first one sizing, Rich, in the lower right hand corner, you'll see is you can oh. increase it with that bar. Okay, cool. So the first column is going to be whatever you want to call the system. So I call mine FCSO. That's just Frederick County Sheriff's Office. You can use whatever name you want here. It doesn't matter. Leave the column names the same, though. This is what the system is reading to determine. The next column is your frequency in megahertz, so that's correct. There is no offset. Um, I had my network access code, which I got from uh, Radio Reference, which is 441. The modulation is compatible quad sure phase shift keying, so that's the uh, and that's listed in the um, Radio Reference as well. Then you reference a file that contains the talk group ID tags. So tags are not working. It should be able to add tags to the stream, but that's it's giving me errors right now. I'm not sure what's going on. And then finally, I whitelist talk group 5402. So it's going to receive all of them, but I only want to hear what's going on in the primary dispatch channel. The other thing I can do is just blacklist, but there's over 100 talk groups, so it's easier just to say here's the one I want versus the ones I don't want. So this is the first file you have to set up, and you can get a lot of that information from radio reference. The other file you want to look at, and we'll go to recent, is the actual um, tags file. So here I have the talk group ID, or in this case 5402. I give it a name, so Frederick County Sheriff's Office Dispatch 1. And then if you have multiple talk groups, there's an optional third column where you can set priority. So you can say if somebody's talking on this one, it's priority 1. The default priority is 3 if you don't specify anything. So Anything lower number is higher priority, so one is the highest priority, and then everything else, if I had other talk groups listed here, would would defer to, to decoding that, that talk group first. So you have to set up these two files. That, that's, that's the first step. And then you're going to have the actual software. So I'm going to go ahead and just show you the... Uh, let's close the VNC window. Let's go to... Terminal. So on the left-hand side here, I have my Raspberry Pi. So if I go to my code, 
There's a couple of things in here. The service is actually being run. Service is being run via this shell script, and then I have a systemd um, uh, services that launch this. So the first thing I get is my host IP, what port I want to use. I go to the project where I have my code, and I copy the key files I'm going to need to configure this to where they need to be with the Op25 software. So when you download Op25 or you clone it, it goes to a directory called Op25, and then there's an install script in there that installs it and sets up a bunch of stuff. The um, decoder app I'm using is in this apps directory. So we go to that directory, and then from this point, I kind of list out all of the options that I'm sending to the system. So just for my own understanding. So first, if there's encrypted traffic, just silence it. I don't want to hear you know stuff that sounds like an old modem, raspy and you know stun intelligible. Um, I send it the args RTL. I'm telling it to use the drivers for that USB dongle. I set the gain. You can set this higher. So you can experiment with the gain. It's easy to experiment with it using GQRX. You want to bring the signals that you're interested up as high as possible without raising the noise floor. Um, the source sample rate I have very high right now, 960,000 samples a second. That's probably overkill. Um, you can set some fine-tuning options with Q and D. So Q is in steps of 1,200, D is in steps of 100. Dash X with a capital, this is the experimental frequency error tracking. So this will auto-tune the system for you. It's a great option. One I discovered, it's just wonderful. You can set the debug level from 1 to 10, so you can have all kinds of debug if you want. Um, I enable the phase 2 time division multiple access decode, but that's not what the county is using. It doesn't cause an issue, but I do pass that argument. You give it the location of your trunk file, and then from the trunk file, it will look up the location of the um, talk group tag file. I tell it this is going to be voice-coded traffic. This W option is important for liquid soap. So this is also used to um, output raw packets for Wireshark, but this is what liquid soap is using as well. There's a meta JSON file that I'll show you guys that has some information for talking to the IceCast server and sending data to it. And then we have the dash L sets up the web interface for this. So rather than log in via VNC or um, look at some output in a, in a standard out, I can just go to a website and see how this is doing. The one thing that tripped me up here, and this is a real got you, is you'll notice there's no slashes. So you say dash L, HTTP is the protocol, colon, skip the slashes, put your IP address in your port. If you include slashes here, you get weird errors, and it took me a while to figure out why that wasn't working. So it's just a little annoyance. And then I just repeat all those options. So I explain what they are up top and repeat them down below. So that is <clears throat> the entire command that is sent to um, the RxPy application, which is the receiving application inside that directory. So we can also look at our Op25 uh, Liquid app. Let me go here. This ships with the software. The only changes I made to it, if you scroll down, are sending it the appropriate um, values to talk to the IceCast server. So there's various things I had to set here. The mount point, the password for my IceCast server. It's all on my local networks. It doesn't matter. You guys see the password. Um, the port number, the IP address, where to find the IceCast server. There's, there's several things you need to set in here in order to talk to your IceCast server. So this is all being launched via services, so we can take a look at these services. The first thing I'm doing is I am defining these as systemd user services. So these are services that are running as just an unprivileged user. So I don't need to use root to do this. Um, systemd allows you to do this, it's very nice. So you can see that under multi-user target once there's it's going to launch these services, and then these are the service definitions. So we can look at the receive service, and basically what it says is just run that wherever your user host directory normally is, go to this directory and just run that shell script. Uh, restart every five seconds and restart if it, start, if it fails. You know, there's some information. You can add additional things here. 
And it's a similar story with the IceCast source client where it just says run the um, op25 uh, liquid. So it's going to say set the working directory here. This is really important. So I had trouble getting this um, client working until I set the working directory to where it wanted to be and then use the liquid soap executable to run this program. So this is an interpreter for the instructions in this program. And as long as the working directory is correct, everything works fine. If you try to just run this directly, it won't work for you. So I had this as my exec start, just this line, it, it failed. So it's it's you have to set the working directory for it. Um, so that lets me run services as an unprivileged user. If I go to, the only other thing you need to do is use login control. Show user uh, I. And this, this set here, linger is yes. So what that means is keep this log, uh, keep this running if I'm not available. And you can do that by just saying login control enable linger. So I'll show you that on the other server as well. But that allows my services to start up without my having to be logged in. So that's really the, the complete setup here. The Op25 project is right here. There's an install script. There's a readme to explain this. There's a readme on how to do this with RPI3, which basically transferred to the Pi 4. There's just a couple of packages that were different. And then if you drill down in here, there's a lot of different projects under here. So I'm using the GR Op25 repeater, and it has a bunch of apps. If you uh, you can explore around in here, there's, there's different things you can do. Folks use this same receiver to detect like L-band satellite traffic, basically how you, you can get patch antennas for it. So you can do all kinds of things with this. A buddy of mine was using it to decode, um, what's the system, like ABS or something, whatever the, the airlines use. He lives near Dallas, so he can see, he can plot the tracks of airliners coming in because he's listening to their radio traffic on FAA frequencies for you know their location and altitude and direction of travel and speed and all that stuff. Um, you can get all of that if you want to decode that as well. Um, so there's various things here. If you go down into the apps directory, what my program does is it copies the op25 liquid file that I created. It copies my trunking file here. It copies my uh, Frederick County Sheriff's Office. Where's that at? Let me find it right here. So a lot of things are copied into here and then and then everything is set to run. So so I do drop like the script I want to run to launch the program and, and various things are dropped in here. That's really the setup on the Pi. I can check. Um, let's just get out of here. Let's see this a little better. So I can say, you know, as a as a regular user, what's the status? Op twenty five RX service, and it tells me everything that's going on. I can actually um, tell it no pager, let's see, no ellipse, ellipse size anything, and then just let the data wrap. So it's just showing me everything that's going on. Sometimes you get these weird errors, and I got to restart it. And then it's the same story with the liquid server. I can look at that as well. So this is the IceCast client sending everything to my IceCast server. So on the right hand, so let's take a look at this Op25. I think I showed you some of this already, but this is the interface. and You can see channels being dynamically decoded. And we can look at the various plots and see what's going on with the uh, traffic. And eh, it's still kind of fuzzy. I wish these would be more cleanly defined like that. That's really what you want. Um, so for the IceCast server, we'll go back to here. So I have a couple of things going on here. Here's Here are the list of recordings that I'm grabbing. I'm just going to maximize this. So it's it's grabbing traffic and updating this. So you'll see that 378,000 is, or what's that, it's hundreds, 3.78 megabytes is what I typically in a half hour there's a bunch of services i'm running so if i do a uh and again these are running unprivileged so i can go to my config user and what i have here are two timers and two services so systemd timers are extremely powerful if i look at this archive stream zero zero timer this is a timer that triggers at the top of the hour um it's going to run every hour, so I just use on calendar hourly. Timer expressions are extremely powerful. You could say every third Monday in November 
except even numbered years or something like it's amazing what you can do here so i say this timer is going to activate at the top of every hour now the way system d works is when the timer triggers it looks for a service with the matching name so in this case it would be this service right here um so we can do a cat of that this service is a one-shot service. It's just going to run and quit. It's not going to get forked to do any kind of magic. And then you give it the location for it. So here it's archive stream sh. So if I look at that, so I go to my FCSO directory, and then I just curl. And I give it uh, a file name based on, you know, a formatting of what the current date is. And I hit that IceCast server. So this is the stream URL for, for what's currently being received on the IceCast server. And then I tell it to collect 31 minutes. So at the top of the hour, a timer is going to go off and record 31 minutes of data using curl. At the bottom of the hour, a separate timer will go off and collect 31 minutes. So I always have one minute of overlap in case there's anything going on, I don't want to miss what's happening. So if I look at the other, um, I look at the other timer and service, you'll see that they're exactly the same. They just trigger at different times. So this one's going to say at the bottom of every hour, so 30 minutes and zero seconds, and I don't care what day, day of the week or date it is, it's going to trigger to go off, and that will run a service with the same name, which is in this case right here and that'll just run that same archive stream so i'm getting 31 minutes of data so if i go back to my fcso we list it here's all the recordings i've captured so this is now most of these are just dead air time there's really not much traffic especially late at night unless there's something going on i do have some examples of some things so i do save some interesting things my son gets involved with i'll play one of those for you in a second let me see what else i want to show you so the IceCast streaming is right here. This is the admin interface for it. It's on port 8000. And this is on the server that's running uh, Fedora 34. If I click on this, it'll download the op25 M3U file. So that's not that great. That That's basically a list of streams that are currently available. If you open it, you can play it. Apple defaults to a... Uh, this the player that it's using, the music player. But you can also just, if you punch in that directly, if you punch this URL in directly, you can just listen to the stream. So let's see if there's anything going on. Right you can now. change that default, by the way. Yeah, I know. I, I, I should. But if you just punch that in, it brings up this interface. So here you are listening to it with the, you know, just listening what's going on live. There's no calls going out right now. In fact, we can go back over here now that this is now that this is active. You can see any time uh, 5402 will show up. That means that the cops are talking on the dispatch channel. So that's county maintenance or something. So there's a bunch of different channels that will show up, but I'm not, they're not whitelisted, so I'm not listening to them. But every now and then you'll see a 5402. So my son was involved in a chase the other day. So let's go to my butter recordings here. So this one right here was from May 26th. He had a drunk driver at 2.30 in the morning at speeds of over 100 miles an hour, and they terminated the chase. Very few jurisdictions will chase because it's just so dangerous. Um, you'll hear the police in this calling out the, how safe it is to chase the guy. The roads are clear. They have good visibility, all that, but the, the, the sergeant nixes it. He doesn't want them getting into any kind of crashes or anything. Interestingly, so this driver was very drunk at, or you know, weaving all over the place at 2.30 in the morning, he was eventually found the next morning at 6.30 out of gas on eastbound 70, and he blew, like, over the legal limit. So he was he was drunk enough that he was still drunk four hours later. Um, so this is what the recording will sound like. I can hear. Okay. 222 to 270 north at 80. We're on 5 Edward Nora, 1143. 234 Frederick. All right, so my son is, I don't know if you guys can hear that very clearly, but my son is 677. That's his, that's his call sign. He just called out a, a 
license plate. He's northbound on 270, you know, location, and he's, he's got somebody that's interesting. You'll hear him say 1050. That means that the car wrecked. You also hear him say another call, uh, another 10 number, which means the guy's suspected to be drunk. I have one mail on route to FAJ similar. The driver woke up and he's taken off down the side of 270 up the shoulder. He just drove up the guardrail on 1050 to the woods. Six seventy seven, ten four, six sixty four to rest. He's going to be continuing northbound. He keeps running off the shoulder into the grass. He's probably going to be severely 1055. 669 is at 85 and 270 with stop sticks. 669, So I'll pause right there. So his partner, one of the other units that was nearby, is up ahead near Urbana, and he has the ability to deploy the stop sticks. But you'll hear the sergeant get on pretty quickly and just terminate the chase because they're going over 100 miles an hour. Here. 10 on dispatch one, three units on disabled vehicle 270 northbound. So that means they just dedicated dispatch one to the, what's going on right now. So my son's chase of this drunk driver is the only traffic you'll hear on dispatch one at this point. So everybody else has switched to three. So they're no longer on this channel. Northbound traffic's light. Uh, he's picking up his speed a little bit right now. We're at about 98. <laughs> 77 and he's last seen 270 north past the Monocacy, coming up on 85, and he just turned off all of his lights. 77, 10 Frank, come back to 77, comes back to 1309, Minnesota Way, Upper Marble. All right, so we'll stop. So then they give the, 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 you know, the address of the person and what they're doing and, you know, why this is so bad and just all kinds of information. So, um, some of these things are interesting. I have some recordings. My son hit a deer. He had to have a, uh, sergeant come over and you know help him do the paperwork and get a new vehicle so stuff like that happens as well it's not always that exciting but um, let's see what else I want to show you so all of the instructions I followed I tried to record it all or write it all down so there is a github location uh, my user id on github and then rpi 4-op25 so I explain how I set up my pi I bought a can of kit um, I installed Ras Raspberry Pi OS. I configured all these different things for it. So you set your country, your language, all different things. I enabled SSH and VNC. Scrolling through here. I installed the GNU software-defined radio. I connected the RTL-SDR receiver. Confirmed that everything is recognized. And, and this is something I noticed that the receiver, when I plug it into the Pi, it doesn't seem to seat real strongly. So if it gets bumped or jostled, you might have this device disappear. So you want to make sure that you're able to see the tuner when you when you power up. And you can just do LSUSB and look and make sure it's there. Then you'll go into the ref radio reference and get all the parameters you're going to need. I explain what they are, where to find them. Uh, you can use GQRX to make sure you're tuned to the control channel. That's important, that, that the one that's in the radio reference is actually the one they're using. Those things can change. Um, and then install LibreOffice if you don't already have it. And then you enable, uh, you install the um, OP25 software. It takes about 10 minutes to compile all this. And then you'll um, pull down the code I have and you can tweak it for the different settings and things. And then I think I go into setting up all the different service files and setting up the IceCast server and what things you need to change in the IceCast XML file and then basically how to run it all and enable the different services. So it's all kind of there, how to archive the streams, what the OP25 web interface looks like, playing things on the ICAST server, all that stuff is included. So pretty cool. Um, and that's and you said this can, this can run on a Pi 3? 
It can. When you go to build Op 25, it's probably going to take you like an hour. Some people said it's pretty slow, but with the with the Pi 4, it was less than five minutes, ten minutes, something like yeah. that. It was, very, it was very quick. And I have a I have a lot of memory on that Pi 4, so I have like eight gigs. Right. Um, we can still we can try to listen to this. See if there's anything going on. Let me uh see see what's going on live. And again, there's like a there's about a thirty second delay here. March yep. one thirteen. So you hear some some talking. You know. Yeah. Every now and then you'll hear the dispatchers call out a unit number in welfare, and they just say okay or. 10-4 or whatever, so they just, when you're on a traffic stop, every five minutes they ask if you're okay. So so you get the, you know, you can hear all that stuff. My son's off today, so these are these are other units that are working. Patty's number is 240-446-6700. So you can listen to it live, and like I said, I archive it, and then I go back and listen to things that are interesting. Um and that's basically all I got, Mark. Um, let me see what else I could show you. Oh, the meta files. So there's some other files here. Let me uh, minimize this guy. You go to the RPI 4 op 25. The meta JSON file is just information that Liquid Soap needs to talk to your IceCast server. So here I have the, the uh, password, the mount point, server IP address, and port number. And then some of this this tag stuff isn't working, and I'm not sure why. Other people are complaining too, so I don't think it's it's me necessarily. The M3U file is just a list of streams. So if you look at that file, all you're going to see are the URLs for the actual streams. And IceCast could be a whole subject that unto itself. Like you can set up internet radio basically and have multiple streams you can tune to and listen to and get a list of them. So that's... Uh, that's what I did to decode public safety radio. Any questions or I've about 45 minutes left? That is pretty cool. I I majored in criminal justice at Nova, so I I like listening to that that stuff on the radio. <laughs> And, you know, you can just go to Broadcastify and listen to it as well. It's just going to be a mix of all the fire um, traffic as well as the police traffic. So if you just want to hear the police traffic, it's great to just, you know, decode it yourself because then you can whitelist, blacklist, and just do what you want. And I was joking with my son, you know, I'm like, you could just program your radio to listen to the sewer guys or the water guys. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I'd get in so much trouble if I was wasting time like that. But yeah, so, uh, you know, an RPI-4 can of kit, like I got the, I think it's like around 80 bucks, maybe less. And then that receiver is right around 40. So for less than a couple hundred bucks, you can have a pretty cool do-it-yourself scanner and just pick up whatever traffic you want to pick up. And yeah. Hopefully that, uh, go ahead, Mark. No, one of the uh, things that you, you did was you used System D as a user. And so much of the discussion about System D is the root portion of it. But there's so much you can do with System D as a user. I'm not sure that that knowledge is as widespread as it should be. Yeah, and one of the reasons you want to do that, let me get back to this. Um, let me show you something very important here. So if I go to config System D user. Is that not showing me my oh what on the Raspberry Pi? Do you know how to see the SE Linux context? Like, how do you get that? Anyway, I'll I'll show it on this one then. So if I go to my, uh, System D configuration the fedora i'm an unconfined user so when you're running as an unprivileged user a lot of the policies don't af apply to you because you can't do stuff anyway you're unprivileged so being unconfined means you can listen on different ports you can you know do things that are above port 1024 without much problem 
if you try to run systemd services as actual services, more policy is applied because you're typically running these as either a system account or a root account. So what the system wants to protect itself and make sure you're not doing anything bad. So you'll get confined user here instead of unconfined. And that brings a whole other set of policies into bear that, you know, can really restrict what you're able to do. You'll get weird errors and stuff if you don't fix all that. So doing that as an unprivileged user, it's just a lot easier to run services and timers and sockets and all the things you want to do. So it's it's a lot easier to deal with system D if you just run it as a user. And like I said, if you use that, if I do login control, let's see, show users. Uh, this is my wife's computer, so it's her account. But, uh, yeah, you just have to set linger and it'll, it'll, it'll run your services whether you're logged in or not. And all that really does, you know, a lot of system D is just files. It's files and links. So if I go to like... Uh, AirLive, systemd, I think it's linger. It just creates a file for her. I don't think there's nothing in it. It's just a marker file that says this user will linger if, if they're not logged in, still start their services. So I, you can use login control and enable linger and say, or you can just create this file. <laughs> it's this it's the same effect. Just like when you enable or disable services, if you go into your uh um, configuration here really all you're doing is creating these directories for the default target and the multi-user target and if you look at those they're just links to the services that are one directory above so they're just soft links that's just a soft link so you can either create the links yourself or you can use the system control commands to do all that so yeah it's uh it's pretty interesting, and like I said, I'm I'm cleaning it up, so I'm only keeping about 14 days worth of recordings. I'm, I'm encoding it with the uh, this this value right here is the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. The reason I do that is when there's uh, rollback or roll, you know, the the daylight savings. These these times may overlap, so I want to make sure they're always unique, even if they do overlap. So I can say, okay, here's. June 5th, 8.30, June 5th, 9 o'clock in the morning, and, and so on. So these are in military time. Because you, didn't, because you didn't want it in Zulu time. Yeah. I, I don't want, these are all local times. This is all local time. Hence the, the, hence the uh, daylight savings gotcha. Yeah. Interesting approach to that. I just put the, the time stamp here, and then that way, when my son says something happened at 2.30, I can just quickly go look it up. I don't have to translate between Zulu and lots of files there. All right, I'll stop sharing. So that's just what I wanted to show you guys. So, yeah, using System D is great, and you can set up all these services and timers. It's very intuitive. Uh, the 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 calendar capability, like when to trigger a timer, is basically whatever you want. Like it's it's, it's it'll do whatever you want essentially. Oh, and then the temp file things. I wanted to show you guys the temp. I'll share my screen one more time. Sorry, temp file cleanup. So this is this is an important feature. You don't want to keep stuff around forever. Um, so in Etsy, let's see, should be. Something here to clean up the temp files. Trying to see where I put it. There it is. So temp files D. So this directory Etsy temp files D. There is a service that comes with system D that will clean up files based on the criteria you give it. So you can set any configuration files you want in here. And I have one set called um, here. So this is going to be cleaning up my public safety files. So what it says is E says don't delete things that already exist, but in this specific path, make sure files have this permission. They're owned by this user in this group. 
and any files older than 14 days get deleted. So older than 14 days has a very specific definition. It means the file was neither accessed, updated, modified, or created in the last 14 days. So if it's older than that, it's gone. So I'm just going to keep 14 days worth of files available. So this is just a by just having this one line here, there's a whole uh, man page on this. I think it's like temp files D. So it tells you what all these options are and explains what they are and how they work. So E says directory to clean up, load user group cleanup age and ignore the last argument. So um, there's various things you can do here, various options for the, the um, creation and deletion of temporary files. This is really meant for file systems like slash run or temp, which aren't really file systems anyway. They're sort of pseudo file systems for status things and things like that. But you can use this same facility to clean up your own files. So that's the last thing that I I created here was, and I discussed this in the GitHub page, but just keeping this so it doesn't just overflow the disk and cause all kinds of issues on the, the IceCast server. So I just keep a 14 day win, running window and anything older gets deleted. And that was the last thing I wanted to show you. <laughs> uh, in regards to trunking and the RTL SDR, it's able to listen in on the control frequency and the frequency that all the radios have been turned to for a talk group because it's able to record at the same time that it's also seeing control traffic on a different frequency. So that's a good question. I don't know how multiband this thing can get. I know that um, the way the protocol works, I'm only listening on one talk group anyway, and I'm actually probably listening on the new market repeater where I'm located. So the radio is actually, the, the antenna is right next to me here. It's just, I set it to about, I don't know, six inches each each dipole. So it's just on a little tripod sitting next to me on my desk. But the nearest repeater is in new markets. So I'm only listening on one talk group. And anytime somebody broadcasts, I just tune to that, whatever the dynamically assigned channel is, and then release it. But you'll see that it is seeing all of this other, it's seeing all these other frequencies. So it's seeing, this could just be information coming across the control channel that I'm just recording. I don't know that it's necessarily tuning all of these. So the, the, the lack of talk group ID isn't necessarily that's an encrypted channel. Is the is the control channel also encrypted or just the voice portion of the No, the only things that get encrypted are the traffic channels. So the talk groups are what they can encrypt or not encrypt. They don't encrypt the control channel because the control channel is just status and control. Um now if you try to broadcast on that frequency, you'll get in trouble. Like that's that's violation of FCC and other things. You're 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 directly interfering with their operations if you try to jam it or anything like that. But um, the control channels, just instructions, like somebody requests access to this talk group, you won't be able to hear their traffic. In fact, if you tune any of these ones that are uh, encrypted, it just sounds like garbage. And that was something that was kind of frustrating for me. Let me go back. Like some, some places are ridiculous. Pennsylvania, as an example, I grew up in Beaver County. They have... Some of the wackiest setup ever. Most of these things are encrypted. Let me see if I can find a law enforcement that's on. I was trying to hear some, some traffic, and all I was getting was basically just noise. Like, they actually have... Let me see. This just shows the location of where things are, but... I tried to listen to some historical data here, and all I got was uh, encrypted traffic. Actually, it was on radio. It was on Broadcastify. Let me go there. Listen, Pennsylvania, Beaver County. So, like, Fire and EMS, most of this is going to be encrypted. Like, if you go to the feed archives, you're not going to be able to hear anything. So... I don't know why people are uploading this because it's it's not really listenable. So that's just that's just background noise. But when they actually broadcast, you're not going to be able to understand what's happening. I think it was the police groups. Let me let me go to not fire and EMS, but. Um, 
I was able to find a law enforcement link, but all I got was noise. There was there was nothing being decoded. So that's one of the downsides is like some of these this database isn't always completely up to date on what's going on and then you don't hear uh, you, you're not able to receive stuff. So you really have to pay attention to whether it's encrypted or not and if you'll be able to receive it. I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, so even on a, an encrypted channel, the, the talk group is uh, broadcast on, the, on that control channel. So there's some indication of activity happening, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah, you can always see like, who's talking. Like You'll see all kinds of talk groups. And if you look those numbers up, in radio reference, you can see like what they're referring to. So like, here's here's the ones that are being captured by Broadcastify. Let me uh, go back here. So databases, Maryland, Frederick, Frederick, Frederick. So we see five five four one a lot. I think that's one of the. Uh, that's just the, that's the EMS dispatch channel. So that's what that's right here. And if you click on this, you can actually listen to just that channel, but they don't do a very good job. I think these are very short, like two seconds, one second, three seconds. So these things are being sent too often. It's it's just it's just a mess. You know, it's it's like each individual uh, um, burst is being captured. Um, so I wanted something a little easier than that. Same thing with the sheriff, like five four zero two. Here's 13 seconds, one second, two seconds. So I'm not sure who's providing this information, but it's not very usable if you try to use it, if you try to listen to it. So that's another reason I just set up my own. But there's a ton of information here. Uh, since it's the weekend, most of the city and county services aren't going to be broadcasting. These guys don't work on the weekends, generally. Lucky them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this was a lot of fun. So so I really enjoyed drilling into this. The RTLSDR um, website is another one to look at. So not only can you buy stuff there, but they have a quick start guide. They talk about best ways to set up your antenna, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, there's There's a bunch of different things they walk you through. Now, a lot of this is Windows-based, so there's different programs in Windows that can help you do this, but um, I was able to use GQRX. If you install GQRX and those, the device is detected, you can see that with LSUSB, you're, you're able to decode a lot of stuff. So they have different things here, some troubleshooting information. You know, my system's not working for whatever reason. They try to give you some clues. So it's, it's a pretty... Pretty amazing site. And then there's articles and people have done things. Here's tutorials on like satellite communications, listening to NOAA weather satellites, um, decoding Inmarsat if you're in, on the ocean. So there's all kinds of stuff you can do. Working with single board computers, radio astronomy, if you want to get into that. You know, P one uh, phase one, P25 is what I was looking at. Here's some decoding with OP25 and phase two. So they get into all of that stuff. A lot of tutorials here and um, useful information. So this is a great website. In addition to being able to buy the thing, you can actually do a lot of fun too. And like I said, I went to their store. I uh, there's a lot of electronics in here. Um, they kind of own all that. And then this took this took six weeks to receive it. So and it's uh, thirty seven ninety five for the whole kit. So rtl-sdr.com is very useful. Very interesting, Rich. That was very cool. Uh, that was. I enjoyed that. And, and I, I will be getting my antenna actually later today. So I'm going <laughs> to, I know what I'm doing tomorrow. Today I'm, I'm setting up, um, I don't know, flight aware. They track airline flights. And they have a, a Raspberry Pi thing, and what you can do is you can listen to the jets as planes as they fly over. And if you use their solution, they give you their premium uh, account for free. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be setting that up later today, and then 
this I'm going to do tomorrow. Well, it's interesting. If you drill into some of the tutorials on RTL SDR, some people have taken that mount where they have sort of the V, the two whip antennas in a V pattern inside like a pie dish. So somebody punched a hole in their wife's pie dish and they mount this thing. So it's like, a, you know, it, it collects and it lets it more be, be more directional. So they're, they're receiving all kinds of signals. Like, oh, wow. you, like people get super creative with how they set these things up. But you can order patch antennas and things. You can pick up satellite traffic, you know, all sorts of stuff. I think people are listening to like International Space Station. Whatever, you know, if it's encrypted, you're not going to be able to understand it. But you can detect all the energy out there and. Thanks. This was a great presentation.